Uh, I want to introduce these second speakers. Uh, Dr. Vincent Wong, he was here 10 years ago. Yeah, 10 years ago when we did the uh, uh, 25th anniversary of TRA. Dr. Wang was from Taiwan and he graduated from National Taiwan University. He went to John Hopkins. I don't know how come we have so many John Hopkins today here. And then he went to the University of Chicago. After graduate, he went to the University of Miami, teaching there. And then in 2001, he went to the University of Richmond in the Department of Political Science. And he walked his way to the chair of the department. Currently, he is the associate dean of arts and the science. And he's one of the recognized, well recognized expert in Asia's study in Taiwan and uh, China and in, in particular in the security and economic issues. Uh, he's uh, one of the few people who really care about Taiwan. As a matter of fact, he helped not only uh, his school and uh, academically, he involved in a lot of activities outside his school. One of the very important functions he's serving right now, he is the advisor, advisor to uh, the Taiwan Benevolent Association of uh, uh, America. They have a grassroots uh, people to, to people the 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 policy is the executive director try to get people, American people's attention on Taiwan. And let's welcome Dr. Wen Xin Wang. Thank you, Dr. Lin, for that very kind and generous um, Introduction, and it's a pleasure to be back to um, the Taiwan Studies. Um, and after hearing of, of Dr. Simon Bain's um, very powerful um, presentation, so I will probably preface my presentation as the sense and sensibility of Taiwan Relations Act at 35. And I probably would begin with a little bit of sensibility, just a little bit, but most of it on the sense of the TRA. So as uh, uh, the two Dr. Lin's uh, mentioned, um, December 15th, 1978, I think that um, you will know, uh, I think most, most of us will remember where you were when a significant event happened. And to me, I remember exactly where I was, Dr. Lin. I was actually in one of those pictures. <laughs> so that, I was a freshman at uh, National Taiwan University, and today I, I, um, one of my college uh, um, buddy, uh, uh, Mr. Joseph Xu, is here. So I'm basically telling you, I'm selling out myself how old I am. <laughs> but anyway, um, the news came to, um, to us uh, freshman at NTU campus uh, as a shock. Uh, the, the atmosphere was very gloomy. Uh, I think that after the, the trip to Songshan Airport, uh, I went back to the dorm, I took a cold shower because I have no idea what's going to happen to Taiwan. Uh, the society was very pessimistic. Uh, at that time, uh, Taiwan was just the beginning of the economic miracle. Uh, the per capita GDP was about $2,000. And Taiwan was not yet democratic, it was only barely beginning to democratize. It's a still an authoritarian system. So then you have the Taiwan Relations Act. 35 years later, uh, Taiwan uh, now has per capita G GDP over 20,000 US dollars. You use uh, purchasing power parity is way over uh, $30,000. Taiwan is a multi-party democracy, even though it's not perfect but it is the only one uh, of all the um, uh, 
uh, ethnic Chinese societies, uh, despite the recent um, dispute over the service uh, in trade agreement. And I think that's actually one, one way to look at the, the vibrancy of the Taiwanese uh, democracy. So some would argue that and this is possible because uh, the Taiwan's uh, evolution uh, into a, um, a vibrant democracy and the economic success story actually benefited from the peace and stability engendered by the Taiwan Relations Act. But we are social scientists. We know that sometimes it's very too simplistic to attribute, every, to attribute everything to one cause. But we can use a, a thought experiment. Had there been no Taiwan's Relations Act in its current form, would Taiwan have fared better? I think the answer is probably no. So I think we should give uh, TRA a little bit of credit, probably a lot of credit. I think that Dan would probably you know, like to hear that because you know, he's American, but um, well, I'm American too, but uh, <laughs> I'm American Taiwanese from Kaohsiung, actually. <laughs> so anyway, um, my presentation is going to uh, focus on three things. One, why the TRA is actually a unique legislation. And in fact, it's not a small feat that we are celebrating its 35th anniversary. And I agree with the Dr. Simon Ding. We need to be vigilant because the next 35 years is by no means uh, taken for granted. So this is, we need, I need to go back to 1979 to tell you just how unique this is. And those political forces, those alignment of stars, may not be there in the future. And secondly, I will talk about the successes and failures or shortcomings of the TRA. And thirdly, uh, I will ponder uh, where TRA is leading to. So speculate a little bit on the future. Um, I think uh, just now we had uh, uh, Congressman uh, Ed Royce with us. He's obviously a very strong supporter of Taiwan. And the origin of the TRA uh, also benefited from uh, a group of uh, what, what I call the framers, senators and congressmen who were friends of Taiwan, who were very concerned about the future well-being of the people of Taiwan. And they were dissatisfied with the way the Carter administration uh, negotiated normalization with the PRC. So they wanted to do something uh, for Taiwan but this is at, there, but there was actually a conundrum, so basically an unprecedented situation. Here I'm quoting uh, Congressman Stephen Solart. I think many of you in the audience know uh, Congressman Solart. He was a very Im important person. So he said, how do we solve this uh, unprecedented, unprecedented uh, diplomatic problem? How to con continue U.S. substantive relations with the people on Taiwan, even though the U.S. government terminated diplomatic relations with the government in Taipei as a precondition for normalization of relations with Beijing. Indeed, uh, as someone already uh, pointed out, I think Dr. Lin also uh, alluded to, that the United States uh, had actually never uh, severed diplomatic relations with a friendly country and ally. And that, to Taiwan, that was the first one. So a lot of people felt very bad about it. And then uh, I'm also quoting another uh, senator, Jacob Javits from New York. He said, th th I think his sentiment, his, his words uh, said uh, at, 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 back at that time uh, reflected the, uh, the dilemma faced by uh, a lot of Americans. We could no longer operate under the fiction that the government in Taipei was the government of all China, but neither could we ignore the fact that the people of Taiwan have been our friends and allies for decades, and that we had assisted in protecting them from domination by the communist regime on the mainland. So Congress, uh, the lawmakers uh, understood uh, that it was the US national interest to normalize relations with the PRC, but they also wanted to protect the interests of Taiwan and its people. Okay. And this, of course, um, is cause for some legislative uh, innovation. And the result was uh, Taiwan Relations Act. So there are three unique aspects of TRA. 
Uh, one is that it is a pragmatic arrangement of relations between the United States and Taiwan. This fills a, uh, a, a gap in traditional international law because traditionally an unrecognized state is very limited, is very restricted in terms of the rights to sue or the rights to be sued and so on. But the TRA, particularly Section 4, has language that essentially treats Taiwan as a country or as a state or as a government. I think that the most recent example is the visa waiver program. If you go to the State Department website and you find the name, name of countries, the 37 countries which currently enjoy VWP from uh, Taiwan, next to Taiwan there's an asterisk, a footnote basically, saying that according to Taiwan Relations Act, wherever our law, the US laws apply, it applies to Taiwan. So this is the best example of how Taiwan actually, even though it was not re no longer recognized by the U.S. government, but the U.S. laws continue treating Taiwan as a state, as a government. It has own, its own immigrant quota. It had it continued it, at that time in 1979, even though uh, the United States had recognized China, and China claimed Taiwan to be a part of China. But you have a funny situation that the United States gave, quote unquote, a part of China the so-called most favored nation status and uh, GSP, the generalized system of preferences, and it gave the mainland nothing, neither. So this is, a, I think this is a, uh, uh, if you look at the substance, you will know this is a pragmatic arrangement for continuing and even enhancing the substantive relations between the U.S. and Taiwan after the diplomatic recognition. Of course, uh, you would say that the United States uh, did this because its reputation is on the line. But I don't think that explains the whole thing. The U.S. real interests were also involved. So one reason the TRA could succeed was because it blends realism and idealism. This is why it could succeed. Okay? If you only talk about you know, some highly uh, glorified rhetoric, it will not succeed. The U.S. actually had real interest uh, in uh, at stake. The U.S. was, uh, at that time, the number one trading partner of Taiwan. About 40% of uh, Taiwanese exports uh, ended up in, um, in the U.S. market. And the, the peace and stability of Taiwan was very important to the security of the Western Pacific, where the United States have crucial national interests. Of course, the U.S. reputation was also on the line. If the U.S., uh, at that time, uh, we encouraged ask ourselves this question, what have we done to deserve the U.S. derecognition? Obviously nothing. Taiwan didn't do anything. It was just the U.S. national interest changed. And that was a condition set by Beijing as part one of the three conditions for normalizing relations. You must break diplomatic ties with the ROC. That was, so basically, the current administration accepted all those three conditions breaking diplomatic relations, abrogation of the mutual defense treaty, and uh, withdrawal of U.S. troops. So the, the T TRA uh, was probably very unique in this regard. It was a pragmatic arrangement to continue substantive relationship after the di diplomatic derecognition. Second, it's unique in that it was a very unusual legislative and uh, uh, executive equilibrium. The reason I say this is traditionally um, the executive branch enjoys the upper hand in foreign policy. But in this regard, Congress was mad at the Carter administration. Congress also wanted to assert itself uh, in the aftermath of uh, a president using uh, troops abroad in, uh, after the Vietnam War. So Congress had actually taken up unusual interest, as Dr. Lee mentioned, that the Carter administration is sending a very anemic uh, Taiwan enabling act, and Congress took over and rewrote it, and the result was a TRA. So Congress had, on the issue of Taiwan, has shown unusual interest uh, and activism that was actually very rare of, of any other country. So in a way, Taiwan can compensate its lack of access to the executive branch by its support from Congress. 
Okay? Because the, US, the, the Taiwan is no longer recognized by the executive branch, but Taiwan has many friends in Congress. But that was uh, in the late 70s. I will say this with a caveat, because now uh, the Chinese, the mainland Chinese, have also become more sophisticated in uh, Congress. So Taiwan's job is actually more difficult. But anyway, um, because the TRA has this uh, uh, um, wrangling between the executive and the legislative branch, it's not certain that any attempt to strengthen it or to weaken it over the years has actually succeeded. So a lot of people wanted to uh, strengthen it. For example, the 2000 Taiwan Security Enhancement Act, as Dr. Simon Ling correctly pointed out, it cleared the House, but it was tabled by the Senate. Because Senate, as the second House chamber of the US Congress, is supposed to be uh, more cautious and so on. And over the years, there are also some people that will call the Taiwan Relations Act a relic of the Cold War and wants to get rid of it. Neither attempt has succeeded. Most of the people who are in their right mind uh, feel that the TRA has done a good job, even though it may not be 100% satisfactory to anyone, depending on your perspective, but I think in the grand scheme of things, it has done a pretty good job. So it's unlikely that any attempt to push it one direction or another will succeed. So I'm saying that the kind of a legislative executive equilibrium achieved in 1979 is probably unlikely to, uh, to meet again in the future. So uh, I think we, we should do, uh, we should, we should, we should uh, uh, do our best to um, strengthen U.S.-Taiwan relations uh, within the current uh, uh, legal framework. Of course, the executive branch still uh, is responsible for implementing the law. And the third point, which is actually important, but a lot of people didn't pay attention, is that I think conceptually, the Taiwan Relations Act was actually conceived as a transitory arrangement. In other words, it was not supposed to last 100 years or 200 years or forever. Because it was a, um, it was a, it was a pragmatic but necessary and even exceptional arrangement for Taiwan during a period of diplomatic limbo caused by the U.S. de-recognition in 1979. The reason I say this is uh, Taiwan's uh, loss of status was mainly due to the U.S. government policy. What had Taiwan changed? Uh, the former, the last uh, State Department ROC desk officer, Ambassador uh, Harvey Feldman, once said, until December uh, 14th, 11.59 p.m., the United States of America recognized the government in Taipei as the government of all China, right? It's the legal government of all China. And one minute later, the United States recognized the government in Beijing as the legal government of all China. So during that one minute, what had Taiwan changed? Nothing. Taiwan was still Taiwan. The only thing that changed was uh, the, U the US policy. So essentially, the United States created the diplomatic limbo, limbo excuse me, for Taiwan, which uh, the United States called the status quo. And it's one of the most unfortunate uh, terms. Uh, but you know, people in uh, Washington, D.C. like to observe it. So it's one of the terms that they most favor. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm waiting for Dan to, uh, to, uh, to educate us. So the reason I say this is transitory is no, no education even there. <laughs> <laughs> so theoretically, just think about this for a moment. Theoretically, uh, and this is according to Professor uh, Laurie Fisher Damrosh, who actually worked for the State Department uh, Legal Advisor's Office at that time. She is now a professor at Columbia Law School. She said that theoretically, if Taiwan were to declare de jure independence and establish an independent sovereign Taiwan state, the TRA would cease to, uh, will, will become unnecessary. Because under the current US laws, the US president has ample authority 
to recognize, recognize this new state. But of course, it has to you know, bear considerable diplomatic cost because China is going to go mad, right? On the contrary, if Taiwan should also decide to peacefully join the mainland, uh, presumably be, uh, when the latter becomes freer and more prosperous, the TRA would also become obsolete. Right? So, in, so logically, the TRA was enacted only in tandem with the status quo constructed by the United States. Essentially, no unification for China and no recognition for Taiwan. Right. So ask about or to explain what the status quo is. Uh, I, I just love this. I, damn, I, 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 can't, I can't help it. So uh, on uh, April 21st, 2004, the then Assistant Secretary of State for East Asian and Pacific Affairs, James Kelly, in a congressional testimony, uh, people ask him, well, what, you know, you, 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 tell, you, you keep constantly say, no unilateral change of status quo. Can you explain what status quo is? And he said, the United States does not support unilateral moves that would change the status quo as we define it. And I underline those three words, as we define it, as you guys define it. For Beijing, this means no use of force or threat to use a force against Taiwan. For Taipei, it means exercising prudence in managing all aspects of cross-strait relations. For both sides, it means no statements or actions that will unilaterally alter Taiwan's status. This was in 2004. Of course, it was uh, during the Chen shui administration and uh, it, from Taipei, there were uh, attempts uh, for such as the referendum and so on that were seen as pushing the status quo. Having said that, the United States was actually studiously very silent about the final outcome about uh, cross-strait relations. So it emphasized the peaceful resolution of disputes. It emphasized a process, not endorsing a particular outcome. So I've said it's unique in that it has this pragmatic origin, it has this ambiguous nature, and it has uh, this transitory design. Having all these quote-unquote imperfections, the TRA has actually done a pretty good job in ensuring three things that are most important to Taiwan. One is uh, Taiwan's prosperity, so continuing uh, commercial relations. One is Taiwan's security. And the other, of course, is Taiwan's democratic evolution. I'll only say a few words about each. Now, Congressman uh, Ed Royce just mentioned uh, he wished that the, that uh, uh, very uh, successful IT firm in Kaohsiung could just export you know, the, all, all over the world and would contribute to Taiwan's uh, prosperity. He was right. He was obviously right about that because Taiwan's economy is known as so-called export-led growth strategy, which obviously required a open, stable international environment and access to the U.S. market and technology and so on. Taiwan Relations Act gave Taiwan special consideration so Taiwan could continue uh, trading with all the countries and including the United States. And I don't need to repeat the success story uh, for Taiwan and there. Now, security commitment. Uh, some uh, commentators have talked about this, and Dr. Simon Lin wants to ask uh, if, the, uh, if a Section 2 of a TRA is paper tiger or not. I'm actually very interested in that question as well, because the language says um, that the United States will make available to Taiwan such defense articles and defense services in such quantity so as to enable Taiwan to maintain a sufficient self-defense capability. And the United States will, as this gentleman just asked, the U.S. will maintain the capacity to resist any resort to force that will jeopardize the security and social economic system of the people on Taiwan. Now, are these words just uh, empty words? or they actually mean something. Some people say that it is just words, that it is only a piece of paper because the United States policy is actually strategic ambiguity. I hope it's not ambiguous um, strategy, but anyway. That basically, uh, if neither Beijing nor Taipei push the envelope, the United States will not be put to test. 
So it's a piece of paper. So in that regard, you can say the TRA has actually succeeded by uh, bringing in both Beijing and Taipei. However, um, some other scholars believe that the TRA works like a uh, defense treaty, in fact, if, if not more. Because usually, in the case of a security alliance, it only talks about an attack. But TRA actually mentioned the social economic system and the way of life of the people of Taiwan. So again, I'm quoting uh, the Senate Foreign Relations Committee Chairman, Frank Church at that time. He said, the TRA security provisions are very broad indeed, broader than the objective of the mutual defense treaty, which had to do with an attack, and only an attack, whereas the TRA has considered not only the security, but also the social and economic system of the people in Taiwan, and not only the resort to force, but other forms of coercion. So you keep, if you compare these, you, you might say that the TRA, uh, you know, if, if TRA is not uh, put to test, it's a success. But if TRA is to, te to test, the president must maintain the capacity to resist the use of force and coercion. And Dr. Lin also uh, uh, show us the 1995-1996 Taiwan Strait Crisis. Though those are, you know, probably good examples of how the TRA might be used in, uh, in the case of a contingency. Finally, uh, another aspect that not, not too many people pay too much attention was that Section 2C actually says the preservation and the enhancement of human rights of all people in Taiwan is an objective of the United States. In other words, a freer Taiwan respecting human rights can make a stronger case for continued greater U.S. support. In 1978, Taiwan was not yet free. And uh, the United States government, even though this was a diplomatic setback to Taiwan, nevertheless wanted to give the incumbent government some incentive that if you can uh, become, if, if, you can, if, if you can liberalize, then uh, all these protections about your security and the economy uh, will be well deserved. Right? So, and then the rest is story because we know that Taiwan uh, evolved into a democracy. So I think the Taiwan Relations Act, we need to give, them, uh, give the TRA a certain credit in preserving Taiwan's uh, security, economy, and freedom. Where the TRA falls short, in my opinion, is to give Taiwanese people dignity. And I say this in uh, particular in terms of Taiwan's international space. I'm a scholar of international relations, and I, I think a lot about Taiwan's international space. My daughter was born on October 24th, which I don't know uh, how many of you know, actually was the United Nations Day, right? And the ROC was a funding member of the United Nations. But uh, after 1971, uh, Taiwan has been uh, essentially missing from you, all UN uh, bodies. So uh, TRA section number four also said that the United States does not support any attempt to exclude Taiwan or expel Taiwan from international organizations. At that time, Taiwan had uh, membership in uh, the IMF and the World Bank and so on. But of course, we know that Taiwan now is very isolated, but, you know, of course, uh, um, and, and I, I do think that even though I, I love President Bill Clinton, I do think that his uh, three-note speech in Shanghai in 1998 was very damaging to Taiwan uh, as an international personality. So he said, basically said, you know, no, no, uh, no one Taiwan, one China, and no uh, U.S. support, no Taiwan independence, and no uh, U.S. support of Taiwan membership in intergovernmental organizations that requires statehood. To me, uh, a policy of non-recognition of statehood should not be used as uh, the reason for denying uh, that entities a right to participate in international organizations. So I think that Taiwan Relations Act uh, was, I mean, again, this probably, uh, we cannot blame everything on uh, the TRA. So what about the future? Where is the TRA heading to? Um, I, if, if, if I have to predict 
uh, say, uh, if we have this conference again five years from now, the TRA at 40, uh, I will say that the TRA will be unlikely to be changed, at least in the next five years or 10 years. Again, for three reasons. One is uh, this resilience, the inherent resilience, resilience built into the, the system. Um, as I said earlier, uh, over the years, attempts to alter the TRA, either strengthening it or weakening it, have, have not succeeded. Um, so we, 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 we have essentially uh, this situation that it is the executive branch that should, we should expect the executive branch to faithfully implement the TRA. If the, all the executive branch can faithfully implement TRA, TRA is actually very sufficient. What we are concerned is if the executive branch does not faithfully implement the TRA. And Congress will always uh, keep a very watchful eye to monitor the implementation of the TRA. The second reason uh, I believe that TRA is unlikely to be changed is uh, uh, maybe I would call it a personnel or continuity. Uh, the people uh, in the administration, both uh, Republicans or Democrats, of course currently, uh, you, uh, when, when Obama first came to power, his Deputy Secretary of State, uh, James Steinberg, Assistant Secretary of State for East Asia and Pacific Affairs, Kurt Campbell, National Security uh, uh, Senior Director for Asian Affairs, Jeff Bader, and the Deputy Assistant, uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Asian and Pacific Affairs, Derek Mitchell. These are all people who knew a lot about the Taiwan Relations Act. They're all uh, insiders, essentially. Of course, some of them have left. Uh, now, of course, Assistant Secretary of S uh, State uh, for East Asian Pacific Affairs is Danny Russell, and the guy in the National Security Council is uh, Evan Madero. They are still very knowledgeable people. Uh, yeah, I, I don't expect that, uh, uh, well, uh, just now somebody mentioned that the U.S. policy appears contradictory. You have the three communiques, you have the Taiwan Relations Act, you have the six assurances. Yes, over time, that sometimes, if, uh, because, and the U.S. policy is so nuanced that sometimes uh, officials will misspeak. But I think the essence of the policy will continue, and most of the people in these cru crucial positions have, are very knowledgeable about uh, the policy's essence. And of course, if in 2016 the Republican Party uh, came back to power again, we will have another group of people, maybe like Dan, you know, who, uh, <laughs> um, who can uh, continue, uh, 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 you know, putting their understanding of the TRA uh, on their job. And thirdly, uh, I will say that uh, the, it's, uh, the reason I believe that TRA will continue is that it is actually not a policy priority for the current administration. The current administration, the Obama administration, of course, uh, is reacting to a lot of foreign policy crises, uh, such as in uh, Ukraine or Syria and so on, uh, North Korea. So it is taking delight that relations between China and Taiwan are actually improving. So it, it, you know, it officially congratulated the both sides and want to see tension continue to ease. So as long as there is no military uh, tension, like in 1995, 1996, the United States can take a back seat and feeling much good about that. So it's not a policy priority. Unless it is a policy priority, it will, not, it will, it, it will be unlikely to change it. So for three, these three reasons, I believe that TRA will celebrate its 40th anniversary. <laughs> so, but but we, we, sh we, we, uh, we should feel very good about it, but not entirely uh, conceded. I think in the long run, uh, there are still three challenges to TRA. As I mentioned earlier, I want to draw your attention back to a, a comment I made earlier, that the TRA is conceptually a transitory design. It's not meant to last forever. So what about the challenges to our TRA? It can come from three sides. One is uh, uh, if China pushes it. I think that increasingly powerful and rising China might present a challenge. The TRA currently has a strategic ambiguity holding both Taipei and Beijing in check. But if one day uh, Beijing feels that time is on its side, 
and can solve the Taiwan issue on its own terms, this will challenge the TRA. Okay. And of course, the United States will be put uh, to uh, uh, test at that time. And perhaps it's also in, uh, in light of this development that some people in the United States began to talk about abandoning Taiwan. Again, uh, Dr. Simon Ling uh, talked about this. Uh, their reasoning is that, uh, their reasoning are, 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 are multiple. One is that China, it ultimately, China is more important than Taiwan, and the United States should uh, try to get along with uh, China. And, uh, and, and the cost of defending and supporting Taiwan is only going to rise to a point that the United States can no longer pay the cost. Therefore, it's better to abandon Taiwan now. And the most ridiculous example is by this uh, Harvard scholar who wrote an article in New York Times that we can sell out Taiwan for uh, uh, China canceling our national debt of $1.4 <laughs> trillion. Dollars. So cheap. So, they're all, so, so fortunately, uh, these people are not uh, uh, mainstream, I would say, uh, in the U.S. society. And I don't think that their thinking uh, has been accepted by the policy-making community in Washington, D.C. But there are also very um, rigorous scholars, such as uh, Professor John Mearsheimer of the University of Chicago. I, I was not a student of his, but I, I, I took some classes with him. He is one of the preeminent uh, neo-realists of our time. And his argument is that as China becomes more and more powerful, it wants Taiwan, and it will get it. That's basically his argument. Okay? And, then, uh, and, and then his argument is that Taiwan should cut a deal with China uh, now uh, better than later. So far, there have been some rebuttals, but not, someone, not anyone who is of the same caliber as Professor Mearsheimer. So I, I do see that a rising China as the biggest source, potential source, of challenging TRA in the future. Whether there will be a 45th anniversary, uh, you know, it depends on this. Second, of course, is, a second challenge is if a democratic Taiwan uh, should declare, or push for a declared de jure independence, uh, in other words, to challenge the US constructed status quo. Status quo, as I've already mentioned, is a construct, it's not a reality. And this, of course, could uh, also push the TRA. But of course, we already saw the limits of US support in 2003 and four, when former President George W. Bush actually leaned harder on Taiwan President Chen Shui-bian than on the Chinese Premier Wen Jiabao. So this is a second possible source of challenge to TRA. But these two are more obvious than the third one. The third possible long-term challenge to TRA is what I will call um, creepy unification. Um, namely, um, we have paid much attention to what if China attacks Taiwan or Taiwan provoke China. But what if uh, Taiwan wants to join China? And this seems almost unthinkable, but Professor Nancy Tucker of Georgetown University was the first one to ask this question in 2002. She asked, if Taiwan chooses to peacefully join the mainland, should the United States care? Cross-strait relations until 2008 had been primarily a combination of hot war, cold war, cold peace, and so on. But after 2008, cross-strait relations had undergone tremendous changes. And the two sides are very cordial, at least as far as KMT and the CCP are concerned. And this is raising the question of whether Taiwan would be willingly or unwillingly absorbed into the Chinese orbit. And as, as Dr. Simon Lin uh, uh, earlier just asked, if the Chinese continue to giving Taiwanese people the carrots but not the stick, would it be over, would it be uh, eventually successful in winning the hearts and minds of Taiwan people. David Keegan, who was the deputy director of AIT in Taipei, recently wrote an article, and one of his policy recommendations is that the United States should be open to the changes uh, absorbed by, uh, 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 sorry, endorsed by the Taiwanese people. He didn't mention 
uh, what those changes are. But logically, because the U.S. government policy is no support of Taiwan independence, the kind of change he was talking about could only mean if Taiwan people choose to join China, should the United States step aside and not stand in the way. I think if that should happen, the Taiwan Relations Act will also become unnecessary. So having uh, discussed the unique uniqueness of the Taiwan Relations Act, its success, failures, uh, and the shortcomings of TRA, and speculate its future, even though I'm optimistic about the 40th anniversary and so on, but whether the TRA can be called an enduring framework or an accidental success, it seems that 35 years later, we still, still do not have a clear answer. Thank you very much.